Okay, we're going to be taking a look at the game Coalition, the Napoleonic Wars, 1805 to 1815, and it's designed by Javi Garcia de Gaviola from Spain, I believe, and uh, it was published by Compass Games in 2021. Now, I've had the game for oh, well over a year now, but uh, uh, it's been on the shelf, just really haven't given it the attention it deserves. But at the last Compass Games Expo, I bought another game called Pitt's War, which I'm going to show you. Now, Pitt's War actually came out in 2019, and it's designed by Francois Stanislaw Thomas, who also designed, I think, what, um, Napoleon Against Europe, and also um, the other one Compass did, Valmy to Waterloo. Nations in Arms, that's it. Anyway, uh, it did come out first, 2019. Uh, what struck me about Pitt's War, and the reason I bought it, was uh, the map, the counters. It, um, its map it bears a striking resemblance to uh, Coalition, but uh, it has smaller areas, and uh, that will be Stanislaus's third, or I think maybe fourth attempt at doing the whole Napoleonic Wars. It's a much simpler game than his other ones, Nations and Arms and stuff. Uh, I haven't even punched it yet. And again, cosmetically, it looks a lot like Coalition. So, um, with army size units and stuff. So, I don't know. I, I certainly want to give it a try. I didn't know which one to try first. I thought, well, why not try out the one that came out first, 2019. But after reflecting a little bit, Coalition being a boxed game uh, with cards and stuff. I said, no, I'll take a look at that one first. So that's what we're going to look at today, Coalition. Now, I should point out that uh, Christian Van Someren and Dwayne Phillips edited a second edition of the rules, uh, which you can download on Board Game Geek. I've uh, copied it and been yell yelling it in and reading them. Um... I read the second edition rules before reading the original rules, so I got a little bit confused there. Um, I think you should read the original rules first. They're actually very well done, in my opinion, profusely illustrated. And reading these rules, I sort of got the gist of the game already, not taking a knock against the second edition. If there's anomalies in the first, this certainly will clear them up. But for the purposes of the video and my experience of, with the game, which isn't very much by the way, I've just solitaired it. Uh, I'll show you some of the features of the game and uh, how it overall plays. Okay, the manual to Coalition uh, is about 22 pages uh, profusely illustrated, so uh, I didn't have any trouble with the manual at all. Okay, it comes with a mess of cards. It's um, sort of a cross between a card-driven game and a uh, card-assisted game. You get a thicker deck of these event cards, and they're very detailed. All of these will affect gameplay to a large degree. I won't go through them all, but there's Fouché, Long, Roland of the Grand Army, Drew's Grand Battery, Talleyrand, of course, um, all kinds of events which will certainly change the game, especially when you're playing at the army level, and each turn represents one year. You get this other smaller deck of cards, which each power will have. Uh, it's called the home card. So every major power, like the Russian Empire, will have this home card, which gives critical information on it, and the economic points and um, recruit points on it. Uh, these cards are key. Each player will have one. I might point out that it can be played as a two-player game, Great Britain against France, or as a multiplayer game. So you can play up to six players with this. And again, it's army level, so you don't have a lot of counters on the board. You also get these coalition cards. There's, what, three, five of them. And they're important. Because in essence, it's Great Britain against France. But as we know, Great Britain alone would be unable to 
knock out Napoleon, that's for sure. Not with only one army and two fleets. England needs to build a coalition against France, and that's one of the things she'll be wanting to be doing, using her economic points to draw at random one of these coalitions. And depending on which coalition you draw, you'll have various countries arrayed against Napoleon. So the game very much is driven by these coalition cards. The coalitions last for approximately two years and are never repeated again. The only exception is the seventh coalition, which was the last one against Napoleon. And it's special in the sense that even after Napoleon is defeated, and if the French player has the um, Napoleon returns from Elba card and the Waterloo card, he can extend the game and do a last counter blow against the coalition. That's kind of a neat uh, mechanism for that. But in essence, it's the British trying to build coalitions against Napoleon and knock him out of the game. Victory conditions are simple, direct, and I quite like them. For France, they're to occupy Great Britain and knock her out of the war. For Great Britain, to occupy France and knock her out of the war. Or, there's a second victory condition for the France, for French. If they establish the continental system for two years in a row, Great Britain is knocked out of the war. So it's a broad brush look at the Napoleonic Wars, but um, it's a playable game. Now, I played some of the others too. Uh, Napoleon against Europe and uh, other large Napoleonic games. And, uh, you know, they take all day to play or a weekend. This one can be played in a much shorter time. That's why I like it. Now, when I first saw the map, I was a bit concerned because comparing it to um, Pitt's War, which has much more smaller areas, I thought these were kind of large. So I was a bit alarmed at that. But as it turns out, it's not really a concern. It's a um, different kind of game than Pitt's War. But um, what matters is the stacking inside the area. For example, you've got Napoleon's Grand Army somewhere in France, okay. And you've got Messina's Italian Army somewhere in France. It doesn't really matter where in France it is. What matters is if the two armies stack together, obviously they're together. That's one big army under Napoleon and Messina. When they're not stacked, it doesn't really matter where they are in the area, except if they're, let's say, at one of these, he's at Toulon. Napoleon here is at Toulon. He's specifically on that spot. Or if Messina is at Paris, he's at that spot, and so on, whether it be Mainz or over here at Brest. If you think of these little wee ports and fortresses as areas within areas, you'll get the idea. Now, what does that mean if you've got enemy armies in there? Well, not much. If you've got Messina here with the Army of Italy, and you've got Catuza with the Army of the West, as is, it's just like they're in France somewhere. We don't know where. Is Catuza 100 miles to the east? Is he north? It just doesn't matter. It only matters if when Kentuzov or Messina moves, he decides to attack, all you do is put your stack adjacent to the enemy, and that means you're going to attack. You would put an attack marker down as a reminder to show you that that attack is attacking the other stack. So it's a simple mechanic, but it works. Now the other th neat thing that's in there, because it's kind of operational Napoleon, Napoleonic's course 101, is marching to the center of the guns. So for example, if Messina is engaged here with Kutuzov by rolling a die, there's a chance that Napoleon's army will join the combat. So within these large areas, you've got a nice little tactical system built in. And indeed, the example of play that comes at the end of the rules gives you the example of the Hundred Days campaign, 
with Napoleon here, Blucher there, and Wellington's force. And they show you the whole mechanism for Napoleon attacking Blucher and interception and the final battle at Waterloo. They use that as the example of play. So it's an elegant little system within the area, and I quite like it. Over on the left there, you have your tracks, which track the recruitment points, a country a cruise, its economic points, and your victory points. As I mentioned before, each turn represents one year. There's your turn track, 1805, 1806, and so on. So, it's a broad brush structure for the Napoleonic Wars, but that uh, seems very effective. You might have noticed these little boxes on the board. They show four foreign wars, and you've got the possibility of the War of 1812, you've got the Spanish-American Revolt, and way over in the east and north, you've got the Russo-Turkish War, and way in the north, the Russo-Swedish War. So he's taken into account other wars that affected the Napoleonic Wars. He's got pretty well everything in there that I've read about the Napoleonic Wars, at least on the grand strategic level. Of course, there's attrition. So if you find yourself in enemy country and uh, with no supply line back to your country, you're going to be rolling on this table. Depending on your size, you're going to be losing strength points. That's pretty well essential in a Napoleonic game, especially if uh, to simulate 1812 with Napoleon and Russia. There's your battle matrix. Shows you the odds and the combat results. Combat results are very easy. Often armies just lose one step or you flip them. As I mentioned, when they're flipped, you'll see the reduced side with a little yellow sunburst through resource points, recruitment points, you can bring these armies back up to full strength. The Army of the North, for example, has two steps, two and a one. Later on, you can bring recruits in and bring it back up to strength. So those, though there's not a lot of counters on the game, they can be continually uh, replenished. Sequence of play here. Uh, these are the repercussions if a country surrenders. Now, most of that information is also on the player's home cards. So, you're always reminded of the conditions for surrender on your home card. There's a mine of information on the home cards also. Now, how does it play? I can't say a lot about the play because I've only solitaired it. Uh, and solitaire play isn't the optimum way of testing out a game. But if you want a simple Napoleonic game, simpler, you might say, um, this might fit the bill. I probably mentioned this in other videos, but my Napoleonic game of choice for now is still uh, good old Mark McLaughlin's Napoleonic Wars which can be played two players or six. It's out of print now. It's been out of print for a while. But uh, it's quite a good game, too. But this one takes a long time to play, and it's best played with six players. This one is a good compromise. It can be played two or six players. I'm quite anxious to get this uh, in our club and uh, play it with six players. Not a lot more to say on Coalition because it is a simple game. You're going to see wide swings of fortune, as I mentioned, because of these coalition cards and the event cards. So be prepared for that. I wouldn't say it's a luck-based game. I'm sure that there's skill in there, but no question luck is going to play a factor, as in the real Napoleonic Wars. So that's it for coalition. Maybe I'll get a chance to look at um, Pitt's War in comparison. So uh, that's it for now, and thank you for watching.